Thank you. Uh, Ms. Groves. Oh, Ms. Groves, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to go back to the $300 million, um, only because it's not pocket change. So the $300 million, is that just placeholder dollars? I mean, if nobody oh, knows dear. exactly what it's going to cost? Is it just kind of placeholder like this is, and if, and if it is placeholder dollars, how'd you come up with 300 million to start? The, uh, the administration uh, in conjunction with other departments, we have reached out to our counterparts who are part of the work group, is how the 300 million was originated. However, it's so early in the game that we do understand that we, this is a placeholder, it is an estimate, we necessarily don't know. Should we find that we need additional funding, we would come back at requesting supplemental appropriations. How, how did you reach out to your work groups and what response did they give you to come up with 300 million? Where'd you get the 300 million dollars? I could provide you with those additional details as I don't have them with me at this time. Do you know anything about them? Can you summarize it? I could talk about it. Yeah, maybe Department of Finance. It's, it's an internal conversation that we have between all the impacted department understanding who are the individuals who are impacted at what stage that the <laughs> illness of each individual um, also the um, th their own criteria in sense of how they tr when they start treating these individuals so those are all the factors that we looked into when we, when we developed this process when we came about with this estimate as I as my colleagues stated, it's it's preliminary at the moment we don't know what the actual impact will be we're working through this stakeholder process and when we'll do, we'll provide an actual assessment that may revise if to extent we do have anything at that time. Do you, do you anticipate that number to change? Are you anticipating that number? I'd really like to know how you came up with the number to see if it was, um, it's a viable number or is it just a number? And I know you said you talked to people and you had a you know, conversation with them, but I'd like to know how you came up with the number. As I pointed out, it just conversations that we had looking at various factors and for now, it, it, could, it could change. We don't, like I said, we don't know yet until we've gone through this whole process. So, How many people are at what stage of treatment and what's the cost for each person? I don't, well, the cost is around $85,000 per person, but we don't, I don't have the actual information in terms of how many people are impacted. There's folks from, um, from various programs that are actually impacted by this program. I don't have that information with me. I could definitely provide you that information. When, was that part it. of your cost analysis to go through each person that was ill and that was going to need this treatment? And if there were 100,000 of them, is, or how did you come up with, I'm just kind of curious how you came up with the 300 million. And my other question is, is do you anticipate it to change and increase? And I think I pretty much answer that question already in terms of, we don't know yet at the moment, and we're still working through the details. So. Would you bring more information back to the committee uh, for the members to have us? Sure, we'll follow up with the staff and let them know. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mr. Bonta. Thank you. I just had a couple questions about the stakeholder slash work group process. Um, what, what's the timeline for completion of that process? Is, is, is there one or is it kind of ongoing? So I apologize. I, as I mentioned, the, the, the process is actually being led by our Health and Human Services Agency and not by the department. So what, what I've mentioned is what I know so far in terms of the March time frame to bring together the affected state and, and local entities. And then I think from there, really, uh, agency is working on what the timeline would look like. What do we, who do we need to include and how do we do the best assessment of this issue? Thank you. I, I was trying to listen closely to the different organizations that were part of the, the list. Written list and, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, one of the things I just was trying to listen for was uh, were there any plans involved in, any, in the pharmaceutical companies? Sure. I didn't think I heard that. That's correct. And is there, is there a plan to engage those important stakeholders at some point? Absolutely. So the first step is agency really bringing together the payers in terms of the state and local agencies where sort of this impact of what's the impact of the general funds that that you know that 300 million issue but the intention is then to expand it and include stakeholders outside of you know government agencies to talk about how do we look at what do we think the estimates are what are the appropriate guidelines you know there are various guidelines out there we know that there are different entities who are revising their guidelines for the use of these these drugs as well as new drugs keep coming out and how do we look at all of that and look at what's appropriate um, and so there's definitely an intention to do that. I think the first is to really bring together the, the, internal, the internal to sort of the administration stakeholders and then go beyond that to bring in our, our health plans, our pharmaceutical partners, as well as the affected stakeholder advocates who are um, representing people with this disease. Thank you. Can I just put something on 
Member Grove. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to put it on the record that it just seems like to me that $300 million at $85,000 a cost, that's 3,000 Californians. I think there are way more than 3,000 Californians that are affected by this disease. So I think that that number is going to come back exponentially higher, much, much, much higher, because it's hard for me to believe that, that all these people talked and came up with a $300 million number, which will only cover 3,000 individuals in the state of California. I'm just curious. Sure. So That's um, why I was so curious about absolutely. the number. Okay. So again, I can only speak from the DHCS perspective on this. Um, a couple of things, if and I don't actually have the number in front of me, but there is in our Medi-Cal budget, separate from the 300 million, a budgeted amount related to this to this issue. Um, so we, I, I don't have it right in front of me. I apologize. I can certainly pull that up. Um, it's not insignificant is, what, is certainly what I know. Um, and that was based on, at the time, what we were projecting based on the guidelines that the department was putting out for our health plans to follow and the estimated sort of number of individuals who we thought were in our program that are affected by the disease. We do think we have a higher prevalence rate than the average population, probably closer to the 5 or 6 percent rate. But certainly there are other agencies within the administration who probably have much higher prevalence rates when you think about like corrections and, and things like that. Um, in addition in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, our program is a matching program. So to the degree 100 million of that, 300 million was coming to the department, at a minimum that would mean $200 million, but probably substantially more than that given that likely the prevalence in, in our population is most significantly uh, laden in the expansion population, which actually has 100 percent federal matching funds, so it actually wouldn't even require any general funds for these first few years, no. given that it's 100 percent federal matching rate. So the size of the actual total depends on which organization is funding it and uh, if there's federal matching involved, and certainly with our department there is. Thank you very much. That helps me understand it better. Thank sure. you. I was only considering the $300 million, so thank you. Ms. Grove and Mr. Chu both have pointed out that only 3,000 folks could be served by this allocation. I love it when there's consensus in our committee, um, but it points out that there's a need uh, that is greater than what we have resources for, so we appreciate the information that you'll provide to the committee members uh, via their offices uh, about how the numbers came together um, and any projections you have about how need will be met going forward beyond what's been, been proposed in the budget. Thank you. Let's go to the speakers. Again, just reminding you, one minute, please. Let's have the first speaker. Mr. Chair and members, <clears throat> excuse me, Rand Martin on behalf of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. AHF is the largest medical care provider, private provider in the world for people with HIV and AIDS. About 380,000 patients worldwide, 16,000 patients here in our home state of California. This is a huge issue. We appreciate the governor and the department recognize the importance of it and carving out a, a certain amount of money to help close the gap. The problem, though, is not making sure that we have the money. The problem is making sure that drug prices are fair and rational and work well within the, the construct of our state budget. We need to make changes in how we fund drug prices, not putting in $300 million for this and $300 million for that. Mr. Chu, we appreciate you're taking a leadership role. For those who don't know, Mr. Chu has introduced a bill, I think as of today, that begins the process of trying to get the drug prices under control. The last thing I'd like to point out is this is not just a hep C issue. While hep C is important to, to AHF because it's a, often a comorbidity of people with HIV, um, antiretrovirals for people with HIV have been a huge problem in terms of pricing for, for more than a decade. Um, and we've been trying to get those prices under control. The department has worked to do that as well. We've had some success, but not nearly as much success as we need to get this whole issue under control. We encourage the legislature to really aggressively take on this issue from a policy standpoint as much as from a budget standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Chaffee representing the California Chronic Care Coalition. It's a coalition that consists of 32 statewide health care advocacy organizations dealing with chronic disease. Uh, we are uh, one of the parties that signed uh, a letter, a coalition, uh, regarding the governor's proposal. Uh, some of the speakers behind me will address that, so I'll uh, defer from that. But I want to let uh, everyone know that we have some of the most knowledgeable and experienced people on hep C and especially drugs in California, if not this country. And we've already met with the governor's office on Friday. We're going to meet with the LAO on Wednesday. We're more than happy with the Department of Finance, uh, the Health and Human Service Agency, wh whoever, anybody. We have some of the, the best information that's been gathered in this country. We have two to 300 uh, reports and documents on this very issue. 
and we're more than happy to make all of it available to the state of California, carte blanche, uh, because we want to have this issue uh, settled and or solved, and uh, we want to be a partner with the state provided. We, we have no bias, uh, no particular way we want to deal with the issue. Uh, uh, we uh, are looking for a solution, and we don't have something preordained that's going to be that way. We have looked at a lot of different options, and we do have feelings about different what's good and bad, but we don't have saying like, it's got to be this way. We want uh, everybody to benefit and not pit one group against another, which is happening today on this issue. We want everybody to, to win, want, and so that's what we're seeking, and uh, said uh, we're, we're here to uh, help out. Anything you want, just let us know, and we're happy to provide it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily Herio. I'm from Project Inform, an HIV and Hepatitis C advocacy and education project, and I am the co-chair of the California Hepatitis Alliance, which is a group of about, <clears throat> excuse me, 90 viral hep organizations concerned about viral hepatitis in California. So first, I wanted to note the price of the drugs has been quoted at $85,000. Um, these drugs, the prices are coming down rapidly. There's competition on the market, and um, you know, with AbbVie's drug on the market now, and Gilead has stated publicly that they're reducing, they're, they're discounting their drugs at 46%. So I think there's a real opportunity for the state of California to aggressively negotiate and get some much, much lower prices for these medications. Also, just to note that the California Technology Assessment Forum, which previously had stated that these drugs were low value, came out on February 17th announcing that at a estimated $40,000 price tag per treatment that these are high value for, for payer systems. So I hope that you'll look at that um, press release. We really want to make sure that the voices of people affected by hepatitis C and other chronic conditions are represented on this work group. Um, it's critical that the people impacted have a voice in what happens here. We want the work group to consider all high-cost drugs and not just hepatitis C drugs. There's a real opportunity here to look at this from a systems perspective and uh, to prepare for other high-cost drugs that might come down the pike, such as drugs to treat Alzheimer's, MS, cystic fibrosis, and this shouldn't be a one-off for one condition. We should think of this strategically. Um, we want the work group to consider the impact of these treatments on public health and ensure that CDPH is actively involved in the process. These are Hep C, Hep B, HIV, other drugs that have higher, higher price tags are infectious diseases, and there's an important role for secondary prevention in HIV, the idea of treatment as prevention, and hepatitis C, the idea of cure as prevention. And we have an opportunity to eliminate hepatitis C in California. We want to make Final sure... Final statement. Could I ask you to wrap, please? Final statement. Sure. Last... Last thing, um, we want to make sure that the work group doesn't come up with one unified utilization policy for all of the entities, the prison population, the ADAP population, the Medi-Cal population, and the state hospital population are all different, have unique characteristics, and so we hope that's taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members, Terry Calgar-Hill, representing the Hemophilia Council of California, representing the 4,000 patients in California with hemophilia. Many of our patients were exposed in the late 1980s, early 1990s um, to uh, HIV as well as hep C, and that was when the clotting factor that they inject into their veins several times a week to remain healthy and active was exposed to these viruses. And so, um, unfortunately, at that time, it wiped out a great number of our community, but those who are now in their late 40s, early 50s that managed to um, address their HIV uh, through the drug cocktails and to continue to take clotting factor that has been highly purified as a biologic also have hep C. So we want to make sure that our patients can be involved in this stakeholder work group process and we applaud the governor's office for putting a placeholder amount in the budget and we appreciate your leadership in addressing the issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Nick Luizos on behalf of the California Association of Health Plans. Uh, we're very interested in this $300 million um, set aside for one hepatitis C therapy, which there's no dispute um, the importance of these new therapies um, on medical treatment. Um, and we're also very interested in the role that our member health plans can play uh, in the worker process down the line um, as it's fully developed. Um, so while we're encouraged that the administration is taking this very seriously, um, it is very worrisome from our perspective that the state even has to set aside this large amount of funding uh, just for one particular drug, uh, particularly since the pricing 
of these drugs is somewhat of a mystery. Um, a few weeks ago in the Senate Health Committee, uh, the representative uh, for one of the manufacturers um, stated in committee that they do not base their pricing for these drugs on the cost of development, um, which we find to be very curious. Um, so from our perspective, the uh, $300 million set aside may not truly reflect um, the entire cost of the state as has been discussed. Um, some of our Medi-Cal managed care plans are still working with the state uh, to receive uh, their supplemental kick payment uh, for hepatitis C drugs. Um, so again, the $300 million may not entirely reflect that, um, and we have some questions in the department on that issue. Um, ultimately, uh, we are encouraged that the LAO will be taking a second look at this um, at the time of the May revise. Um, it, uh, might uh, do us good to uh, ask the LAO or some other state entity to take a longer term uh, longitudinal approach. I always wanted to say that word on the mic. Um, <laughs> with respect to the analysis. I'm going to ask you to wrap. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> once, I start using, <laughs> once I start using long words, um, it, it's, it's very important. Um, in 2015, it's expected that about 12 new blockbuster drugs will be entering the market. So you know, how are we going to pay for these in public programs in the commercial market? And that's, that's a huge concern for us. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Trueworthy on behalf of Anthem Blue Cross and really just want to thank the administration and the legislature for your leadership on tackling this important issue. Anthem Blue Cross just for our Medi-Cal population last year to give you an idea spent over 26 million dollars on just this drug and so we look forward to having more transparency around drug pricing through your leadership in this committee as well as Mr. Chu and your legislation. We really appreciate you introducing that legislation and look forward to working with all of you through the stakeholder process to, I, to work on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Fred Noteware. I represent Pharma, and, and like the previous speakers, I want to thank this committee for bringing uh, the discussion forward today and, and also very much the administration for their leadership, working with all parties. We've had a number of meetings already uh, and look forward to further discussion when they get further down the road on this. Um, and I was glad that there was some clarification about where the manufacturers are vis-a-vis -vis the negotiations, so thank you for that. And then also, another important piece to all this, because there is quite a bit going on in this area, is, are the guidelines that were referenced by the department, the policy guidelines. And essentially what that means is, when do you commence treatment? Which patients are eligible to begin this therapy? Because it's not all patients who have been diagnosed with hepatitis C. It's those patients that, through working with clinicians and other payers, come up with those, those paradigms. So look forward to working with the committee moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Way with Western Center on Law and Poverty. We're concerned with the high cost of these drugs and its impact on low-income consumers. According to a report by the California Healthcare Institute, low-income Californians, specifically those below the poverty line, are three times more likely to be exposed to hep C virus. Considering the disproportionate impact on low-income consumers, we'd like to, the opportunity to be part of the stakeholder group. Thank you. Thank you. Beth Capel for Health Access California. We would also hope to, as consumer advocates who have sponsored legislation in this area, to be included in these conversations. We are working at this moment with Covered California on their approach to this issue. We do, again, want to note that the price of the drug has come down very substantially since uh, a competitor or two came on the market. Competi market competition does help. We would also note that as we have moved more and more people into Medi-Cal managed care, the ability of the state to negotiate effectively has been substantially diminished. The Medi-Cal program with 12 million lives used to have very substantial ability to negotiate prices. Um, with manufacturers. Uh, this is not the only drug Gilead has on the Medi-Cal formula, and we've had a substantial loss of bargaining power on behalf of the state, and apparently our friends, the health plans, are unable to bargain effectively, or so you would gather from what they tell you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Chair members, Kathy Mossberg of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Just want to reiterate a couple comments made for our, our colleagues here at CalHEP. We would encourage this committee who looks at both the Medi-Cal side of things as well as the public health side of things, when that side comes up, to really, really clearly look at prevention and putting some dollars there. We have seen less and less dollars to prevention over the last decade or so, particularly since the recession. So we would encourage you to look at that. Um, also certainly agree with the idea of transparency um, in looking at these drug prices as well. Thank you. Thank you. 
Would you state again on the record just how um, those groups that have interests in participating in a stakeholder conversation do that? You probably could just fill your stakeholder group just with the folks in this room. <laughs> uh, but we'd like it to be really clear how that process is sure, set up so to it's, work. Uh, it's being convened by our health and human services colleagues uh, at, at our agency, and so reaching out to them um, I think would be the best, the best solution. So our assistant secretary there would be the best. You just want to give that phone number out. <laughs> I won't do that to him. I didn't even say his name. <laughs> <laughs> we will continue. People know who it is. <laughs> Obviously, this is an issue that has widespread impact. We want to make sure that there is widespread participation. So. Absolutely. Thank you. I did want to uh, see the, the use of technology. So I know Assemblymember Grove isn't here, but in terms of the Medi-Cal budget today, separate from the $300 million, we have budgeted $106 million just for the Medi-Cal program. So that's in addition to the $300 million, and that is what we're looking to adjust as well for the May revision. Could you speak to the prevention efforts also? Uh, I thought that was an important point, that um, treatment is very important, as is prevention and education. Would you speak to that, please? Sure. So uh, really that lays with our uh, Department of Public Health colleagues, but it is a conversation that we're having about what, how do we look at what are the appropriate uses of this drug to sort of, a, as was talked about, sort of cure as prevention. Um, but uh, we are in constant contact with them about the, these, these issues as well as some others. Mr. Bonta. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you provide clarity again on, on, on the additional funding? For um, for Hep C, what I just mentioned. Y yes. Sure. Sure. So um, we had budgeted it in our Medi-Cal budget, separate from the governor set aside, 106 million dollars uh, total fund expenditure in the current year and in the budget year. Um, we will be updating those numbers, sort of based on what we're seeing in terms of what our plans are are billing us for. As Mr. Luizos mentioned, we are paying out those amounts now. I think we've paid out about 50 million dollars in the last several months, and sort of definitely anticipate um, that level of spending over the next six months um, and continuing to analyze that. But that is $106 million of total funds. I don't have the breakdown between general funds and federal funds um, off the top of my head since someone <laughs> kindly sent it to me <laughs> while we were sitting here. Um, but we can certainly provide more information on the details behind the $106 million. Do you, do you have an ultimate number that includes the matches? So that includes the match. Okay. The $106 million is our total fund expenditure in our current estimate. I just want to reiterate what the chair said about the stakeholder process. I understand the need for staging and sequencing and starting with a group first and then maybe expanding it later, but clearly there's a lot of desire to be part of that stakeholder process. I believe that uh, when all the stakeholders are involved, solutions are more, most likely to be arrived at. So I just want to encourage, I, I know you're the messenger here, so, um, <laughs> it, but, but I encourage that message to be sent back to be as inclusive as possible. Mr. Chu. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I can give you details on the stakeholder process. Let, let's talk offline. Thank you. Okay, um, great. I think Mr. Chu has a question for you. Okay. Actually, that is one of my questions, yes. so could we start with that? Yes. Uh, Jerry Jeffy, California Chronic Care Coalition. As I mentioned in my testimony, we met with the governor's office on Friday, and they actually did go through the process in great detail with us. And uh, I just want to mention that the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Diana Dooley, has designated one of her staff to be the lead on all this and coordinate everything. And they're in the process, state agencies are process of meeting now. And then uh, next month, they'll start meeting with the stakeholders. And, but they wanted to get their act together first. It, but uh, they, they do have everything in part. They're going to definitely reach out to the stakeholders. That's not going to be a problem at all. Thank you. Did you have anything else, Mr. Chu? I, d I did. First of all, I want to just thank the members of the public who have stated their concerns with the skyrocketing uh, price, not just of the drugs, uh, the deals with Hep C, but others. And uh, I also appreciate the comment from the pharmaceutical industry that pricing has been a mystery uh, to policymakers, uh, to departments, and the public, and we need to get around this. Uh, as was alluded to, I did introduce a bill, AB 463, uh, which is really addressed at trying to understand what the real costs are for our highest cost specialty drugs and really to require transparency on the actual costs. Uh, I think we all acknowledge uh, that it is not cheap uh, to invest and do R&D and to manufacture and produce these drugs, but uh, certainly uh, the costs that we've been seeing are astronomical, and we have to get our hands around them. Uh, and this is critical not just for hepatitis C and for HIV and AIDS drugs, but for so many uh, areas of, of illness. Uh, my question and suggestion is I do hope that the working group, uh, as part of the work that you do, gathers 
what data you know of what the actual costs are to produce these drugs. Because uh, while I absolutely appreciate it, and I very much hope that we will see a drop in the price of uh, Savaldi, and if it's actually a 46 percent drop, uh, wow, the power of a hearing or the power of hearings to have that impact. But at the end of the day, uh, we should have enough transparency to have a fair conversation so we're not going through this exercise every single time. So uh, I do hope the working group will be analyzing and understanding and gathering that data, wondering if that is part of the work plan, um, and, and look forward to, uh, to hearing from the working group. Thank you. Let's move on to the palliative care, managed care budget change proposal. Did we skip an item? Issue eight, is that the pediatric? Sorry. Pediatric? Okay. Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, I thought I was losing my mind. No, I, I am. Uh, uh, we do have a hard stop, so we're going to move a sure, little quicker. But please, Very you're correct. Nice. Would you take us through the pediatric palliative care expansion proposal? Sure. So the pediatric palliative care waiver provides palliative care services for children with life-threatening conditions that are anticipated to have at least 30 inpatient days in the coming year absent the waiver. The goals of the pilot were really to minimize hospitalization as well as improve the quality of life for these children. And as demonstrated by the recent evaluation, we've really seen that happen. And so this proposal is to expand that to additional counties. Uh, there were some questions related to the challenge of doing this statewide. It really, it really hinges on the fact that uh, our CCS program is done in partnership with our local county agencies. This program also involves the partnership with home health agencies as well as hospice providers and given that there's the potential for some initial upfront costs all the parties need to be able to come to the table and bear those initial costs and so that's why um, we're proposing an expansion to those counties who are interested but it might take time to sort of have that go statewide um, I do want to note that related to the question about SB 1004 um, which is the next item that we're going to talk about it is not limited to adults and so the the guidelines that we're developing, and today there's an all-day all stakeholder meeting specific to the SB 1004 uh, implementation and the development of those guidelines for palliative care more broadly across our Medi-Cal managed care system. And so that can impact children as well. Um, we're really just doing this on, on dual tracks. We want to continue the good work that we're doing in our pediatric palliative care expansion, but it, that doesn't mean that children will be excluded from the guidelines and the, pra and the policies that we develop under SB 1004. Thank you for merging the two. Anything else you want to add on the next item? And we can take them in conjunction. Sure. I can, it, it is a request for one limited term position to really implement SB 1004. And we need that in order to develop these guidelines and work with stakeholders. Thank you. Anything from finance? Anything from the LAO's office? Uh, questions? Uh, do we have any public comment? Uh, yes. Mr. Chair and members, Terry Calgar-Hill again, this time representing the Children's Hospice and Palliative Care Coalition. We were the original sponsors of the 2006 legislation that created the Partners for Children program for kids. It's a wonderful program that not only saves the state money, but it does the right thing for the families. They have a nurse liaison that the family can contact in the middle of the night if they have an issue, rather than just running to the nearest Children's Hospital emergency room. They work closely with our partners at the Children's Hospitals, as well as our community partners. Partners. And we have always envisioned this should be a program that's statewide, but we've got to take it slowly to ha ensure that the providers are willing to step up and work with, with, the, um, with the state in partnership. And as far as the next item, SB 1004, we also supported that um, last year and provided the star witnesses for the hearing, and we think it's a great program and are participating in that all-day workshop today. So we're wearing lots of hats, but thank you so much, and thank you to the administration. Thank you. Good afternoon. Janice Canallan, Children's Defense Fund of California, and speaking on behalf of Children Now and the United Ways, we just want to thank you for expanding this program. Um, this is extremely successful, and it, it changes the lives of the children and the families that it touches, and we are grateful, and we hope you'll keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we did take two issues in conjunction, so just want to make sure no one misses an opportunity for public comment on the pediatric palliative care expansion proposal, as well as the palliative care, managed care budget change proposal. Finance and finance, did you have anything on either? Uh, LAO's office, any, anything on either? Thank you. Uh, issue 10, our Dentical program. I assume, yes, I assume the state auditor was the first panelist, so. <laughs> Please join us here, Ms. Carlson.
Good afternoon, Chair Thurman and members. My name is Dale Carlson. I'm with the California State Auditor's Office. In December 2014, my office issued an audit report concerning weaknesses in California's Medi-Cal dental program and beneficiaries' access to dental care. I was the team leader for that project. From our work on this report, we issued 24 recommendations to the Department of Health Care Services. I see in the agenda packet is a summary of our report, so I'm going to just spend just very quick few moments on the report, and then I'll talk about the, the recommendations. The first set of issues that we identified related to access to Medi-Cal dental services. We found low dental utilization rates for Medi-Cal child beneficiaries when compared to national utilization rates and the rates of other states. California's rate was 41 percent. It was 12th worst amongst the states that were included in the federal data. We also found low provider participation rates for Medi-Cal dental services. Using a ratio of one provider to 2,000 child beneficiaries, we found that five counties that had about 2,000 child beneficiaries may have had no active providers, an active pri provider being defined as a provider providing at least one Medi-Cal dental service in the, pr in the prior year. We also found 27 counties that had no or too few willing providers. These counties had about 468,000 child beneficiaries who did not receive dental cal services in 2013. A willing provider is a provider who has let the Department of Health Care Services know that they're willing to accept new Medi-Cal patients. We also found low reimbursement rates for providers of Medi-Cal dental services when compared to national and regional averages and the average rates for other states. We looked at the average rate for the 10 most frequently authorized dental procedures and found that California's rate was $22. The national rate was $62. The rates for the Pacific region, which is the five western states, was $70, and the three states that we looked at had state rates from $28 to $53. Furthermore, California cut dental payments by 10 percent for most providers, effective September 2013. The second set of issues we identified relates to health care services monitoring of Medi-Cal dental program. We found that health care services did not always perform annual reimbursement rate reviews required by state law. Since fiscal 2000-2001, health care services issued only two annual reports, one in 2011 and one in 2013. Further, health care services has not complied with its plan for monitoring access to Medi-Cal dental services. To obtain federal approval to reduce, the temp, to reduce payments by 10 percent, health care services stated it would monitor beneficiary utilization and provider participation. As of October 14, 2014, it had not yet done so. Furthermore, health care services actions related to improving beneficiary utilization and provider participation have been ineffective and health care services has not enforced some key provisions of its contract with Delta Dental related to beneficiary utilization and provider participation. Finally, health care services did not fully comply with federal and new state reporting requirements related to services rendered. Sorry, I have one more issue. Healthcare services authorized reimbursements for services that providers purportedly rendered to deceased individuals. Over the five years we examined, healthcare services paid about $70,000 in reimbursements to providers rendering services to 153 individuals who used Social Security numbers belonging to deceased individuals. The recommendations, we made 24 recommendations. They included establish criteria for assessing beneficiary utilization and provider participation, continuously monitor utilization and participation, and based on those results, immediately take action to resolve declining trends, identify and implement changes that minimize or simplify administrative processes for providers, immediately, perf excuse me, immediately resume performing its annual reimbursement rate reviews as required by state law, immediately adhere to its monitoring plan, direct Delta Dental to implement contract provisions related to beneficiary utilization and provider participation, and coordinate with its fiscal intermediaries to recover inappropriate payments made for services purportedly provided to deceased individuals. 
As part of our audit process, we ask auditees to respond on the status of their implementation of our recommendations at various intervals following the issuance of our report. The first interval is 60 days. Healthcare Services submitted its 60-day response to us last Tuesday, February 17th. Of the 24 recommendations made, three recommendations are still under our review. We agree with the Department of Healthcare Services that it has fully implemented one recommendation. Of the remaining 20 recommendations, DHCS says it will implement 15 by the end of the summer of 2015, it will implement two in 2016, and that the implementation is ongoing for three recommendations. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have.